You're listening to Neo Cash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. In the studio with you, it's JJ, Darren, and Pedro. The Mysterium Network, the life and price of Bitcoin, Dash Force with Joel, Darren writes a paper, and much more on episode 206 here on Wednesday, May 10th, 2017. In the traditional markets, we have gold down to $1,219, silver's down to $16.17. Oil's down to $47.39. The Dow is down to 20,943 points. And the 30-year Treasury yield is up to 3.036%. Thank you, Darren. In the crypto markets, Bitcoin is rocketing up at $1,758. Now, in some places, it's even much higher. We'll talk about that later in the show. Litecoin is also up $32.81. Ethereum is up from last week, $86.79. Although Ethereum did cross the $100 mark earlier this week. Yay. Dash is up to $90.48. Dash 2 crossed the $100 mark. And Zcash is up to $96.11. And Monero is up to $30.09. A big week for crypto. I mean, basically, the crypto rode on on Bitcoin's uh, coattails for a while there. So uh, just a reminder that you can tune in to Neocash Radio every Wednesday. I don't want to miss a single moment of awesome Neocash content, including special episodes and bonus interviews. Subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, Podcast Addict, and more. Well, joining us here in the studio for this episode is Joel from Dash Force. Welcome, Joel. Hi, thanks for having me on. Excellent. And Joel, you have uh, spent some time in the crypto space. For, uh, how long have you sort of been, uh, how long have you known about crypto, for one? Uh, since about 2013. So, and then how long have you been sort of an active player in uh, crypto evangelism or crypto, uh, just trading it, using it, that sort of stuff? The same year. Awesome. Jumped right in. Now, uh, some of you might remember Joel was on the show once quite quite a long time ago, uh, maybe two years ago? Probably about two years. Probably about two years ago, and a lot has happened since then, and now you're working for Dash Force. We'll talk to you more about that later in the show, but you're welcome to comment on the news stories that we have. And starting out right off the top, Darren, you've got a new story about Bitfinex. Yeah, so Bitfinex has hired or secured the services of a third-party auditor. Uh, Bitfinex hires third-party auditor Friedman LLP to audit their books. This audit, the audit is expected to be complete uh, by June 30th. And so uh, our listeners might remember that uh, uh, Bitfinex got hacked and then they gave... um, these weird tokens to the people that got hacked and well to, to their, to the people they, yeah. they took away the money from, and then they've uh, redeemed those tokens for dollars, uh, do- it, but not, not really dollar accounts. But, right. Yeah. They didn't give them, they didn't give them U S dollars, even yeah. though Bitfinex handles U S dollars. They gave them tether tokens, which, uh, you can hear about in our previous mm-hmm. episode and we'll probably have a link to that in the blog. Uh, moving on, uh, Darren, we'll, we'll talk about Bitfinex again later. But uh, you have a new network uh, you're talking about here, Mysterium. What is, what is this? Yeah, so Mysterium is on the uh, is uh, planning to be on the Ethereum chain, and uh, there's a token sale coming up in like 20 days or 19 days, and uh, it it's, it does sound interesting. Uh, of course, uh, you know, take anything with a, a grain of salt, and we'll talk more about token investment uh, later in the show. But uh, the Mysterium network aims to decentralize the providing and use of VPNs. Anyone who has tried to use a VPN may have found it difficult. Mysterium would provide people VM, VPN services as well as create more secure uh, use case for VPNs. Uh, usually VPN uh, users have to rely on their provider. They need to trust that the logs are not stored for anonymous use. Mysterium will allow VPN users to choose different VPN, a different VPN every day if they like. It also will streamline the payment mechanism, the, the VPN, uh, is expected to be worth $45 billion a year. This year, like the whole uh, market for VPNs is, is expected to be worth $45 billion, And a streamlined payment model for VPN providers may increase supply, which will lower the price, which, will, which may result in increased demand. So um, basically, anybody with a server could basically set it up so other people can use it as a VPN and you would get some of these tokens that are going to, that are on the pre-sale if you use your VPN uh, for a, um, if you allow people to use your server as a VPN. 
and uh, and so it's 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 that type of setup. And uh, I I did my initial scam check, and I I did see that they do have some code up on uh, GitHub, but that's about as much as I did. So. Okay, wow. So uh, a decentralized VPN that sounds rather interesting. I personally was looking at VPN VPNs earlier this week, and uh, I try. I was going to try one out. I sent a payment in, and it was converted into Bitcoin. And then it took forever. It took like I don't know three or four hours before the, the transaction cleared. And then uh, you know I, I have heard nothing from them, so I, no, I don't yeah. really. I haven't had a good experience so far. Uh, moving on, the uh, you have an, a, a story here about the federal funds rate. Yeah. So uh, one thing I I uh, periodically I check. Uh, where these numbers are going in the in the traditional economy and uh, the federal funds rate, and the effective federal funds rate according to the St. Louis Federal Reserve, has reached zero point nine percent. So, uh, and and short term treasuries are not far behind. Uh, what does this mean, Darren? Well, this means that the Federal Reserve is going to pay more money uh, for the excess deposits that uh, that are on account with the Fed. So the banks uh, need to have 10% of all their on-demand deposits available at all times, and anything above that, uh, they can deposit with the Federal Reserve to earn this 0.9%. And uh, but I, I just think this is an interesting number to watch. Uh, if you were if you look at the graph of the excess reserves, it was dipping there for a while. So that means that money is kind of being circulated more in the economy, and uh, and. But now it started to increase again, and with that increase, has been an increase in this interest rate. So now, has the Fed raised interest rates? Any any the other uh, the the uh, uh, what their they their must, loans? They must have. I mean, I think the last time we talked about it, they raised it to point five to point seven five was their window for the federal funds rate. So they must have raised it from point seven five to one. Well, uh, it's it's recently. just the so the the federal funds rates basically that's how they've sopped up a lot of that uh, mm-hmm. money that's mm-hmm. gone out through the various bailouts that have happened. So right. they've they've sort of instead of letting that money actually influence the circulation and inflate you know uh, price inflation to happen, then uh, they they've sort of introduced this this increase in rates to make it more profitable for banks to just keep their money there. And, right. and do you mean the uh, quantity, quantitative easing? Yeah, they did the quantitative easing, which almost quadrupled the uh, total amount of money. Uh, so you should expect four times the price increases, but you, you don't see that. And the reason you don't see that is because a lot of the banks have just basically tied up their money at the Federal Reserve and earned a, a small amount of interest on that. So is there potential for this causing inflation oh, to yeah, increase? Yeah, yeah, I would say there's a significant potential. You could expect prices to double if uh, all the excess reserves were drains or, or a very significant portion of them were drained. Um, but when I say double, that doesn't include feedback, uh, feedback effects, right? Like uh, people... On mm-hmm. the global world, might yeah. might decide that they want to sell their U.S. dollar denominated assets because the dollar is falling. So, it, it can create like a feedback loop where, uh, where that wouldn't be very pleasant for us. Well, in the US. they they have basically two times, roughly two times, the monetary supply currently in this sort of uh, federal fund. Yeah. So, and and if that was released into the, the circulation, of course, you'd see prices increased by three right. times as much, roughly. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, that's that's what's going on there. Uh, Pedro, you've got a story for us, don't you? Yes, it uh, has to do with uh, taxes in Australia. Wow, so... Oh, joy. Yeah, I don't like taxes. But good news is Australian government makes good on virtual currency pledge. Uh, this is from uh, ethnews.com. So the Australian <clears throat> Department of the Treasury has sought advice from the government-organized fintech advisory group and has repealed the twofold goods and services tax, that's called the GST tax, affecting digital currencies. Uh, as stated within the budget from the 1st of July 2017, purchases of digital currency will no longer be subject to the GST, allowing digital currencies to be treated just like money for GST purposes. The repeal brings closure to a tiresome controversy that has for years troubled virtual currency users down under who've double, um, who had to double pay the GST, first when purchasing a virtual currency and then again when spending it. Under the GST Tax Act of 1999, virtual currencies such as Bitcoin were not recognized as money. Awesome. That's that sounds great. Uh, so that that'll I, I open up the doors for Australia to. 
basically like like Japan. Okay, so so Japan has has made Bitcoin legal there, and and then there's a a bunch of people waiting to buy it, and the price in Japan is is much higher than elsewhere, and we'll talk about that later in the show. But uh, it's always good when um, you know regulatory bodies come out with a consistent you know um, you know identification of how they want digital currencies to be treated. So here in the U.S., unfortunately, it's looked as capital for IRS purposes. And it's looked at as money for uh, FinCEN purposes. So it would be good if the U.S. could get on on one designation of how to treat virtual currencies. Yes, it definitely um, increases chances of regulatory compliance as well, um, because I'm I've heard that in, in the U.S. reporting on cryptocurrency income tends to be pretty low, and part part, part of that might have to do with the difficulty of actually complying to regulations. And so making it just a one simple type thing definitely would increase the chance of of actual reg- regulatory compliance by the average citizen. So it's a very shrewd move on the Australian government's part as well. Excellent. Well, it's good to see this, this sort of stuff happens. It opens up the market and uh, basically a lot of people who are afraid of getting, you know, on the bad side of the tax collector are not going to get any of these things. And, and anybody who's you know, doesn't, you know, this is all I got, you know, it's, it's not something they're willing to risk. So moving on, we're going to talk about a, a Peter Todd. I think, is that, is that one of your favorite characters? Mm, um, no. Darren. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, uh, so Peter Todd is talking about uh, Zcash. Yeah. So uh, Peter Todd was one of the uh, six people who participated in the, uh, the, uh, creating of the parameters. And he, he's, uh, I believe he's the only person that actually broke the instructions and bought a laptop instead of a de- desktop, which was one of the instructions. Wow. But he, he did that so that he could be driving through Canada or something like that, driving um, when moving while he was generating these keys. Uh, okay. He felt like that was a, a good thing. I, I hope he wasn't driving while generating the uh, keys. No, somebody else was driving. Yes, so, there's got to be a law against that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Living on the edge. Yeah, so um, so uh, what he, he recently tweeted that the uh, backdoor that was found in Intel products like the, the processors uh, could have compromised his own participation in, in generating oh, wow. for the Zcash. That does make setup. sense. And he also raises a concern that the backdoor could have compromised uh, putting all the six keys together. Um, but I, I think my personal opinion is even though the concern is valid, it poses a low risk as air gapping was a requirement, as was a requirement should have eliminated most risk. So I, I think that the air gap is the uh, is uh, that, that shows that it was necessary, and um, there there is a, a case for some hanky business. But well, well, one of the WikiLeaks things actually talks about how they would have infect air gap machines, and it involved pre-infecting them, um, and then it, 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 you have to read it for yourself how they how they in, do this sort of thing, but. Um, well, anyway, it, yes, but anyway, security so, is a problem. Wh- I mean, so so this is this um, a bad thing for Zcash then? Or? Well, I, I think it is, but uh, the longer it stays around and and the the price doesn't fall tremendously, um, the the more the stronger the case is made that the, these parameters are not broken. Okay. Well, uh, do you love Neocache Radio as much as we do? Help us continue to grow by leaving a review on iTunes, Google Play, etc. And one of the most valuable currencies of Earth is word of mouth referral. So please tell your smart friends to check us out and check out our podcast, NeocacheRadio.com. Well, we have you here, Joel. Let's quick get to talking about you. And, and just for you uh, folks listening, we're going to have a bonus episode that will come out later this week, probably Friday or Saturday. I, I, it depends on JJ's schedule. Uh, but Joel, welcome to the show, Dash Force. Tell us what have you created with Dash Force? So, uh, right now, under the Dash DAO or Decentralized Autonomous Organization, there's room for a whole lot of things to help in the Dash ecosystem. The main thing was the Dash Core team, just like other cryptocurrencies, as a core development team, etc. And what happens there was a certain messaging gap online, right? There's a certain messaging gap where the core team was very focused on building the currency out as they should, making sure it's a viable product, etc. And there is a lot of 
uh, other coins that you know, it's very com- cryptocurrency is an extremely competitive space. It is, and so a lot of them would try to get a leg up by going online and engaging in a lot of trolling and spreading of in- information, misinformation, a lot of times as well. And I mean, I'm sure we've seen that with the Bitcoin scaling debate. There's just quite a lot on on both sides of just back and forth, screaming things back and forth and. Um, Dash for the longest time was sort of a passive participant in this whole thing. Kind of like, we're going to stay above this. We're going to just not, we're not going to engage. Just let the trolls troll and we're going to do our own thing. And that didn't end up completely working out. There was a lot of misinformation spread out there, sort of tr- uh, presented as fact, a lot of narrative loss. Okay. And so what the Dash Force is originally this is designed to do is to reclaim that narrative, right? Okay. And so that in- included just, uh, going online and responding to all kinds of comments in a professional but informative manner and start taking back the the crypto debate for you know for truth justice and the dash way so to speak right wow. <laughs> so that was the original scope and it's been expanding very quickly now there's a new site that um, I'm the editor of but it's still it's a collaborative project among the three members of the dash force and it's called Dash Force News, and that sort of covers the other thing. For the longest time, I was a crypto journalist, worked for Cointelegraph mainly, and part of the one thing I noticed is almost no one was covering Dash, or if they would, it would just be in some sort of throwaway comment of privacy-centric cryptocurrency Dash, which that was uh, under its Darkcoin uh, branding originally. That was Dash's first great achievement was a privacy feature, but that's there's so much going that's gone on last few years yeah and you know it's been basically three years since that's been an accurate description of dash and so you have all these my lack of a better term like lazy journalists sure. who don't do their work and don't just oh that's so rampant it is so rampant and we yes. we and when we're looking for second backup stories and all things like that you'll find some really bad journalism but uh we, we've we've talked about dash here on the show and we've really tried to help inform people about just how diverse it is not diverse but how uh, you know, it has so many different features built into it that function and work pretty well. And the currency is really solid as far as, as if you look at its price and, and it's moving over the market and things like that. Um, but I think in, in, you know, part of the way that, w- that earlier in the show we talked about, or before the show, we were, I was talking with you about how it's sort of like a redheaded stepchild in a way that it, it gets negative press it, 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 sometimes, not not always negative, yes. not like no. Dash is terrible, but That's it just doesn't That's a very get... apt uh, comparison because yeah. lead developer and founder Evan Duffield is, in fact, a redhead. Wow. Well, I might have some things in common with Evan, but <laughs> uh, a love for crypto crypto is definitely one of them. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's just like Dash doesn't get the credit I think it deserves, and... I, I credited earlier that I think it's because gamblers or speculators that call themselves investors sometimes don't like Dash. It's not volatile enough or it's not, you know, it doesn't have that same crash and burn style that some of the, the profitable uh, pump and dumps have. Yes, it's definitely not something geared for a pump and dump. And just part of that is because... The masternode system, right, helped run the network. There's a second tier of masternodes, and in order to do that, you have to stake a thousand dash, and you earn rewards out directly out of the block reward for that. So it's sort of like a long-term investment. The economic model incentivizes people to have a stake in the network. People that actually vote and make decisions for the network have a stake in it, and they're not there to just to just pump and dump. They're not there to buy and then cut and run and run off of their profits. They're directly economically incentivized to not engage in this kind of you know, sexy behavior according to the market. And so there's a lot of other coins out there that don't have this sort of feature. And it just, that incentivize, well, can I get in? Is it going to go anywhere with hype? And then can I get out at the top? Well, and here's one thing I'm going to bring up, sort of like a devil's advocate. It, it, this, the whole system was, you know, back when Dash was 4 to $6 or whatever, a masternode was 4000 or $6,000. But now if you want a masternode, if you want to get in on the masternode game, you're, you're paying upwards of $100,000, including maybe transaction fees and, and when you bought it and things like that. But, you know, it's, it's, that's, that's a big expenditure now. Yes, exactly. And it's, uh, it's good for the currency long term because if you think about it, uh, some people with you know good good finances can just throw away a few thousand dollars here or there. It's like I'm just going to throw this into see what happens here, right? But if you have a 
big chunk of change like that involved, you're not going to play fast and loose with voting, right? You're not going to vote for, like, I'll just fund this thing that might upend the whole ecosystem. You're going to be very careful in stewarding your investment. Sure. Sure. I think there's that that incentive, too. So, Joel, for for our listeners that aren't that familiar with with Dash, what what would you list as some of the some of the features of Dash that make it unique amongst other cryptos? Yes. So first, instant transactions. Because of the instant send feature, it is, as the CEO of all of coins so succinctly put it, it's the only major payment system in the world that offers instant permanent settlement. Right? Wow. So when you swipe a, cre- a credit card or something, it goes through, but it takes about like 24 hours to go to like actually be confirmed. There might be chargebacks. There might be things like that. Bitcoin was so great because it would be permanently confirmed on the blockchain quickly, but still within like, you know, 10, maybe 20 minutes in the beginning and now possibly hours to days. But with Dash, it's completely, it's confirmed permanently within 1.3 seconds. Wow. So that's one. Two, um, privacy, the um, private send feature, which is sort of a, it's a coin, it's a protocol level coin mixing service is, you know, as far as I know, the first great privacy feature uh, back in the dark one days, one of the first if not the first privacy um, focused coins that then all others like for example Zcash or Monero or whatever are you know come after that and till still to this day hasn't been broken and there's been there's been open challenges out there of here's a transaction see where you, where where it originated from and it still hasn't been broken to this day and number 3 which i think is the least sort of the least talked about the least sizzle but the most important part is uh, decentralized governance so with uh, there's a little over 4,000 masternodes right now, and each of them have a vote in what happens to the remaining 10% of Dash's block reward, right? So Bitcoin, all the new Bitcoin created and all the fees go to the miners. In Dash, 45% go to the miners. 45% go to the masternodes as re- you know, reward for, uh, for helping run the network, and then 10% is this budget, this treasury. And so most of what that used to go to was to fund the core team and development, and it still does that. But the price has gone up tremendously. It's like over $500,000 a month worth of funding to just do stuff. Right. So that's what the masternodes do is they vote. People who are staked in the network, who have an economic incentive to make sure it works well, vote for where where does that money go. And so usually it goes to the core team, although they have vetoed a few core team proposals in the past. And then it goes to the rest of the community. And so th- there is something cool about having a development team that is paid, right? That yeah. has, that gets a, like a monthly, weekly or whatever, a monthly paycheck. And so there's incentivized to keep doing the coin, but also can literally be fired next month, right? If the master and say, you know what? You guys are doing a terrible job. We want a different team. You're not getting paid. Boom. They're out. Wow. And that's kind of a very, I think that's a very powerful thing and certainly could be very useful in Bitcoin right about now. Yeah. Well, hey, we're going to talk more about this with Joel on the bonus episode that will come out later this week. Yep. And we'll get more in-depth into the DAO, uh, Joel's experience with that, and Dash as well. Um, moving on, Darren has written a paper. So our very own Darren has released a paper investigating Bitcoin scaling issues. Wow. There's a lot in this paper. Darren, could you explain what is in your paper? Oh, yes. So uh, the the new part is a, a very simple idea that... The idea is instead of having a hard cap on block size, you have a cap that can be exceeded if the fee density gets high enough. Oh. Um, with with this altered cap, it's easier for users to know if their transactions will be included in a block. That's one of my main complaints about Bitcoin is you can send out your transaction, include a high fee, and not even be sure it's going to be included in a block and like the next three blocks, say. And, um, and uh Okay. The the, uh, the main reason for a cap on the block size is to prevent a DOS attack. Sure. Uh, that's when the network gets flooded with transactions. Uh, th- this altered cap condition, what I'm proposing, uh, if you made such a thing, then you could estimate the cost of a DOS attack. So, um, so instead of saying that you can't DOS the network because we're going to block all your transactions, or at least your transactions that get thrown in with the the actual users' transactions that. <laughs> that don't get confirmed as well, um, then uh, then you can estimate the cost of it. So you know, well, if you did DOS, it's going to cost you $100 a block or something like that. 
And so that can sp- stack up real quick, uh, depending on how fast the blocks come out. But uh, right. I mean, that can easily be uh, 10,000 a day uh, with some of these uh, two and a half blo- minute block times that some of the coins have. Um, so anyway, this is this is just kind of what I'm proposing. I, I think I, I don't necessarily think it's going to be Im- implemented anywhere. I just thought it, it was a nice idea to throw out there uh, to just get people thinking. Um, I think it would be fun if uh, if if a coin that people were invested in did something like this because uh, you could ha- you could throw like a, a block popping party when that block pops open to be a little bit bigger because the fu- the fees aren't high enough. Uh, you could just have a block. It would, you could celebrate that instead of uh, complain about that as uh, is happening with Bitcoin and all that. You know, you celebrate the more you, the higher use. You celebrate the people wanting to use these. So you're things. basically, uh, just to, to, to ask a question for a second, you're, you're, you're proposing that the the problem is there are too many transactions per second that Bitcoin can handle currently. There, right? you, the, well, there, there's too, yeah, there's too many submitted and the Within a short artificial time. constraints on Bitcoin require that it can't handle as much as is submitted. Okay. So, and so as if the fee density, if there are so many more fees available, then... The cap is is lifted. Yeah, that's what I'm to proposing. allow. Yeah, then you just if if the 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 rule is right now the rule is if it's over a megabyte, you know, don't count it as a block. You know, don't put sure. it in a chain or, or or build on the previous block. And uh, so I think that rule should be if you're if you're uh, over under a certain amount, then it's a valid block. Assuming all the transactions and all that stuff are valid, or if it's if it's any size. And the fee density is above a certain amount, then it's a valid block. And one thing about such a constraint is you can take any block and you can see if it satisfies that condition. You don't have to look at what's happening prior or anything like that. So, so to program that in, you just look at the block and you can Im- immediately tell is it valid or not with this new condition. So, okay. Uh, so, and it the, would just base the, it would just look at the block, the total megabytes, mm-hmm. and the fee. Yeah. And then it would base calculate that. And if it, it, yeah. If it passes the density, then it's good. It's good. Yeah. Then it's good. It doesn't matter what the size is. So, what would the practical effects be of that on Bitcoin if that were implemented today? What would we if expect to see happen? Implemented today, I don't know what you would put your. Um, your price at, but I was putting around, I was trying to target five cents per kilobyte. And, uh, then you, you'd probably see three or four, five megabyte blocks. Now I know you see about two or three between two and three megabyte blocks to, to clear out some of these transactions. Yeah. Sure. So what would that do for the average fee? Do you think? Oh, well you could, depending on how you set the rule, if you set it for five cents a kilobyte or, or maybe with the price rise, it would be 10 cents a kilobyte. Uh, so let's just say 10 cents a kilobyte, then, you know, each, if the block was four megabytes big, then uh, you would have 4,000 times 10, 4,000 dimes. So $400 of fees in that block. So, uh, which, that, it, which yeah. with Bitcoin being $1,700, you know, that's, that's a small, small yeah, it's like half drop in the bucket compared yeah. to the block reward right now at yeah. 12 and a half Bitcoin. So it'd be like 0. 0.4 Bitcoin or something like that. Um, which, you know, which, yeah, I mean, you want the fees to be high, but you don't want them to be so high that the, the users are affected and, uh, and, uh, it becomes an unusable system at some point. Now, so, where, where can they find this paper? Oh yeah. You can go to darrentap.com and then I put it at the blo- top new, and then you can click on it and check the signature and all that and click on the paper. And the uh, paper also includes an analysis of what... Yeah, the- so um, the paper includes an analysis of what current technology can support. The conclusion that I draw is that, um, I mean, this is based on uh, Gavin Andreessen and, and uh, other people have uh, thought this through as well. The conclusion that I draw is uh, that a home connection that can watch an SD movie from Netflix can support a Bitcoin node with blocks up to 50 megabytes. That's as if it's not being used for anything else. Up wow. to 50 megabytes. Now, there's an assumption I make that uh, the, the the chain is using some form of extreme thin or X thin blocks. And I'm a bit concerned about this assumption because uh, there was attacks on the Bitcoin Unlimited network this week. And it, the attack was mitigated by turning off X thin blocks. Okay. So, uh, But these extreme thin blocks, they have the potential to uh, allow... Blocks to propagate very quickly using the transactions that are already in the mempool, 
Uh, there's even the possibility that you might be able to fill in transactions that a node never saw. That I mean, it's it's almost like magic. Wow. Um, and so um, I think if those technologies get widespread use and can be made uh, unattackable, um, then uh, then this number 50 megabytes is completely reasonable. Uh, so you can mine from home. I mean, the thing is the blockchain grows and grows and grows. If, if you're mining from home, you can run a prune node. That's no sure. big deal. And I... I I, at, towards the end of the paper, I was trying to think about how to implement it in the Dash network because I don't really think Bitcoin's going to do much. And um, yeah, I'm not too worried about n- nodes at home pruning because of these master nodes that Joel just talked about. So, sure. I mean, there's going to be 4,500 copies of the whole blockchain uh, 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 available even if everybody at home prunes. So. Good stuff, there Darren. Go. We'll definitely have a link to that on Neocash, but you can also check out his blog at, what again, Darren? Well, uh, yeah, DarrenTap.com. There you go, DarrenTap.com. It's just a static HTML page. The life and price of Bitcoin. If you've been watching crypto this week, you've watched Bitcoin go just crazy, and along with it went Ethereum and Dash and all kinds of other currencies, and especially Litecoin, surprisingly. Ripple went just, it went to 16 cents something or, or more, and now it's back. Or it's, it, I, I saw I it go to 21 cents. 21 cents. Oh, yeah. There you go. For a brief time, it was the second biggest uh, crypto for market cap. Yeah. Well, Ripple's turning into waves, and I don't mean the cryptocurrency. Bitcoin's, <laughs> Bitcoin's <laughs> price rise has had many factors. The Japanese yen to Bitcoin trading is leading the charge as far as the sheer numbers concerned. Uh, with trading between Bitcoin and Litecoin is also pulling in strong Polonix. Of course, Polonix is dominating the market in terms of volume with more than $200,000 traded in the last 24 hours between Bitcoin and Litecoin and more than 100000 traded between Bitcoin and Ripple. Node counter shows that Bitcoin Unlimited signaled for 43.3% of the last 1,000 blocks, while SegWit is signaling 31.7%. The Bitcoin mempool is spiking over 110,000 bytes. The network hash rate has eclipsed Darren, what's this? T H T H? Is that t- uh, how do you pronounce that one? Uh, the t- four hundred uh, four Terra million hashes. Terra hashes. Terra hashes. Yes. Okay. Four hundred uh, four million five hundred thousand Terra hashes. Transactions per day are up to three hundred and fifty thousand, bouncing between five and eight per second. So yeah. Bitcoin is pretty much at max capacity. Yeah, well, so. the 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 math behind it says about seven transactions per second. Is that right? Something like that. Yeah, um, for for Litecoin, for Bitcoin. Um, I always thought it was about seven or so. Yeah, yeah. I, I, what can Bitcoin can handle? Yes, yes. Uh, well, on average, it can handle like two to three a second. So right, <laughs> it's it's already. So uh, seen... basically, what this is this is the price of Bitcoin is going up, but you're looking at the mempool. Is is in, is seriously the, pro- the, problem you, because if you look at it, it's a roller coaster. Okay, it spiked up to almost just under ten a uh, uh, hundred thousand bytes, which is roughly a hundred blocks worth yeah. of transactions. So it spiked up to that. It came back down, and it, and then today it spiked up over that amount. Now, if this keeps happening, the spikes are just going to keep getting higher and higher, and the daily mitigation of the downtime might not be enough anymore. So. Like I waited for I waited for a simple transaction um, that was the the service selected the fee for me that I was I was using for this thing, and it took about three or four hours. Now the one I sent another one myself, and I put in a specifically a high fee, and uh, it happened within twenty minutes. Yeah. So that that's the way it is, it's turning out. I I paid a dollar twenty seven. I think that's what it came out to at that time. Now Bitcoin has since gone up from that price. So, you know, it's like how much how much did you pay for your Bitcoin transaction? Could it buy a pizza? <laughs> I, I've been thinking that Bitcoin, unless they fix this transaction issue, the Bitcoin's going to be where you keep, keep keep big amount of funds and you move them rarely. And in if you're moving large amounts of funds, then a dollar twenty seven, a dollar thirty is is appropriate. Right, but it's not appropriate for buying a cup of coffee. No. You know, if I'm going to buy a cup of coffee, I'm going to use something like Dash or or Ether. It's also uh, not appropriate for a coffee shop to accept it. 
I mean, that's another thing. It, it brings right, down merchant right. adoption. Because yeah. they, they, they want their turnaround. They, they're serving that coffee in I three mean, to five minutes. They, yeah. they want them out, you know, the next customer. Yeah. So, Can't be worrying about whether or not this trans- transaction confirmed. I got to worry, worry about whether this milk is going to And then if people don't want to pay the fees, nobody's going to use it even if you implement it. So the cost of implementing it didn't bring you any gain. If now, that's the case. We're, we're not forecasting or telling you what's going to happen or what you should buy or sell. But with this happening right now, Jeff, it seems in Japan, they are spending over two thousand dollars for Bitcoin. Okay, for Japanese Je- the Japanese to Bitcoin pair. Wow. Uh, as of today, I've seen over two thousand. Now, I've also seen the Bitcoin to uh, Chinese yen, uh, yuan at fourteen hundred dollars the same time. So you're seeing a six hundred dollar gap. Now, what I think is, you know, what potentially is happening is there's just not a lot of uh, liquidity in some of these ch- these Japanese exchanges for whatever reason. They just don't have a lot of Bitcoins to sell or whoever doesn't have a lot. Well, it was very recent that uh, the Japanese government basically, you know, said that Bitcoin's legal. Right. For- the volume isn't that high. Now, there's they may be selling for $2,000 plus, but there's only been $25,000 worth of Bitcoin volume. So that's only 10 and a half, uh, you know, that's only... Ten and a half Bitcoin or whatever, so it's not it's it's sort of a misnomer. And so we want to talk briefly about the the market cap and is it appropriate to use the market cap as an identifier for crypto? Yes so this, and no. Wow, there it's it is. Yes, per- and perfect no. answer. All right, we're done. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> That's what I think. I really think it's a it's a fine indicator, but it's not. It's and 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 it should be potential market capitalization in that. You could potentially capitalize uh, $26 billion from Bitcoin, right? But in actuality, in reality, there is probably very little way to to get all of that value. Now, I think what you're missing in the market cap and missing in some of these things are some of the other values that are involved. And we talked about Dash. having So Dash can send coins just like Bitcoin can send coins, right? But it can also do other things that are perhaps even more valuable than just sending coins. Mm-hmm. But that value isn't reflected in the market cap. Now, sure, you could say, well, then why aren't people buying it for, for this amount or that amount? Well, I think people are buying Dash at the price they feel Dash is worth right now. And, and that's, that's what the market decides. But the market cap and the price are two different things. Okay, The price you buy something at, yes, I understand the market cap is a metric of that price, but it's it's I think maybe we ought to do this <laughs> is come up with our own way of rating it and factor in the value multipliers like Ethereum for example just yeah. the token system alone right I mean I, I think if you I think the market value is a indicator but it's not the only one and in, in in your reference you know Bitcoin and Ethereum I my personal feeling is I think Ethereum has more potential than Bitcoin it can do everything Bitcoin can. Uh, it can do things that Bitcoin can't. So it can do, you know, tokens. It can do smart contracts. But Bitcoin's more well known, so that has value too, and it's reflected in Bitcoin being a higher price. And Bitcoin code doesn't change as often. And for people that have large, large sums of money, they don't want to see a lot of, you know, quickly changing code. So it is a indicator, um, but purely on, you know, value. I think that. You know, Ether is bigger than Bitcoin, and I think, you know, Dash is, you know, at, at the very least should have a market cap as big as, as Bitcoin based purely on functionality. But, you know, it's also what's known, right? Back in the day, the Betamax gave you better quality video and audio than VHS. But just because it was technically better doesn't mean it was more wide known and, and it didn't really survive. So, so there's a lot of aspects. Yes, we're also uh, seeing what these cryptocurrencies are being used for, right? So Bitcoin is not being used for buying a proverbial cup of coffee largely, right? It's mm-hmm. more like a store of value, like a literally like a digital gold now. It's like a very stable store of value, doesn't change much, and part of that just feeds into the price. And then there you go with Ethereum with a completely different animal. It can just do all this cool stuff, can do, you know, tokens, can do smart contracts, can power decentralized applications, all this cool stuff. And a lot of that cool stuff isn't being done quite yet. It's all being like worked out, but there's a lot of value in the potential of that technology. And then you get Dash that's something that can be used much more effectively for everyday transactions and transfers in Bitcoin. 
and is kind of not quite there yet because it's, uh, you know, obviously having to encroach on the territory that Bitcoin used to put, used to be in and then left behind. And then there's a whole different value on that practical application. And so that's the thing is it's easy to go down through the list of market caps and be like, oh, this one's worth that. That one's worth this. And those dollar amounts don't reflect detail. They just reflect a large number. And there's a lot that that number says that's not being said out loud. Yeah, I think it's one of the last holdouts from the the legacy financial system and how they looked at things and they looked at uh, the, the uh, market cap of a stock in, in this company. And that but that's, that's a big difference. You know, if you're looking at a company's value, well, they have assets, they have physical uh, items, they have machines and oftentimes buildings too. Yeah, for earnings per share, it's not just about market cap. Right. And and I think that plays into into crypto. I think market cap is one of the indicators. It I think it reflects how well known that is, or at least well known to people that want want to buy it. But, you know, to you and, and Joel's point, it's not the only indicator. And this also can be a little bit of a false indicator as well, because sometimes with Ripple, there might be a bunch of units that are uh, t- tied up and can't be used or aren't being used. And uh, so that would make the market cap seem much higher than daily use would. Yes, there's um, that reminded me something that um, last Friday that Evan Duffield, uh, uh, founder of Dash, said in an interview. He said that so currently a little over half of Dash's coin supply is in masternodes, right? Just being locked down in masternodes. And uh, in an upcoming upgrade, they were going to have um, savings accounts. That and he estimates that'll tie up a whole lot more of that, which will then drive the price up. And that's a kind of interesting indicator. High fees in Bitcoin have frozen a whole lot of funds in small amounts in wallets that are no longer movable because the fee to move them would be higher than the actual value, the actual amount in the wallet. Sure. So that's a whole lot of Bitcoin that now is just like Satoshi's hoard, just stuck there. And that's got to have an effect on the price. Right. Well, so, Joel, one more time, where can people find out about you? Yeah, so you can go to dashforcenews.com. Excellent. And we'll have Darren's paper on the website. Darren Tapp, T-A-P-P dot com. Excellent. So thank you so much for joining us, Joel, on this episode of Neocash Radio. It's been a pleasure. As always, you can check out our blog at neocashradio.com for notes, show notes for all these stories, links to a lot of the stories, and more. Re- this is... Retweet all the things. That's thank you, Darren. All for, of them. For for Neo Cash Radio, this is JJ, Darren, and Pedro. Excellent. Neo Cash Radio. We discuss the future of money today. Mm-hmm.